in the problems that we have been solving for so far in dynamics, we have been working in inertial frames. By inertial frames, we mean those frames of references where no acceleration is possible without an applied force. As I have commented in the past, this of course is an idealization. On the other hand, it is sometimes useful to work in non-inertial frames. where you would see that particles are accelerating without an applied force. The reason for working in non-inertial frames are two volts. Number one, that it makes solution of a problem easier in certain situations. And two, as I already commented, the inertial frame idea of inertial frame is an ideal one, and most uh, in in uh, in real life, the frames are non-inertial, and sometimes their effect is measurable. And for example, the Earth, because of its rotation, is a non-inertial frame, and therefore it has effects that are measurable and that are significant. So, for these two reasons, we will now work on how to solve problems in non-inertial frames. We will be considering two kinds of frames, one a uniformly accelerating frame and two a rotating frame. How an acceleration can arise in such frames without an apparent force is can be seen if you see a form a frame which is a uniformly accelerating frame. Suppose you are in a car which is accelerating in a particular direction with acceleration a as it is moving, you will be seeing other things outside car accelerating backwards. Although there may be no force on those, but you will see them as if they are accelerating backwards. And therefore, you see qualitatively how sitting in a non-inertial frame or in a uniformly accelerating frame, you see things accelerating past you, but without any other any force being applied on them. We want to solve problems in these frames applying Newton's second law. that states that force equals m times the acceleration. Therefore, if you see things accelerating without any apparent force to account for this apparent acceleration, you have to introduce certain forces and we call these forces the fictitious or pseudo forces. For example, if you are sitting in a uniformly accelerating frame, you will have to imagine as if there is a force pulling things backwards opposite in the direction in which you are accelerating and that would be an a, a fictitious force which is equal to m times a. Let us see this quantitatively. Suppose there is a fixed inertial frame. Let me call this x prime, y prime with origin at O prime and let us have another frame which at time t equal to 0 is coincident with these axes x, y with origin O, but this frame is accelerating to the right with an acceleration A. If that is the case, 
you can write the transformation equations as after time t what you would see is that the original frame is fixed where it is, but the accelerating frame has moved forward by a distance of one half a t square in time t. And therefore, you can write that x would be equal to x prime minus one half a t square y equals y prime and if there is a z axis z equals z prime. Therefore, for a particle being observed in the two frames x double prime would be equal to x prime uh, x double dot that is the acceleration in the accelerating frame would be x prime double dot minus a y double prime would be equal to y prime y double dot will be y prime double dot. So, you see acceleration in the accelerating frame has decreased by an amount a. If x prime double dot is 0 that is the acceleration in the fixed inertial frame is 0 you see that x double dot is equal to minus a that is you will see things moving past you accelerating backwards. And the way we explain it as I said earlier is by introducing a pseudo force. Let us see how that comes about. So, just talking in this one dimensional case x double dot which is the acceleration in the accelerating frame is equal to x prime double dot minus a. If I multiply both side by m mass this is m x prime double dot minus m a this recall is the true force f applied because x prime double dot is the acceleration in the inertial frame. So, this is real f applied force in the x direction minus m a and therefore, the acceleration in the accelerating frame I write as f applied minus m a divided by m this entire thing is like a new force which is calculated by f equals f applied or external minus m a which is a fictitious or a pseudo force introduced to account for this kinematic effect. The kinematic effect is because I am sitting in a frame which is accelerating I see things accelerating past me for no apparent reason. So, reason I attach is I introduce a force and now I have got my equation of motion and that is that in the accelerating frame I would describe the change in the x coordinate as f in the x direction applied minus m a and that should solution of divided by m solution of this should give me x as a function of time. In general let me write r double dot in the accelerating frame as f in the accelerating frame f external or f applied minus m a vector where a is the direction of acceleration of the uniformly accelerating frame divided by m. This is going to be my equation of motion in the accelerating frame. I emphasize again the force that we have introduced m a is a pseudo force. It does not exist in nature, but we feel as if things are accelerating past. So, we introduce this force and solution of this gives solution gives r in the accelerating frame as a function of time. One comment about this pseudo force that we have introduced minus m a, it is like, like gravitational 
spots on the surface of the earth except that its direction is slightly different. Recall that if I have a body on the surface of the earth all parts of it are pulled towards the earth by a uniform acceleration g. Similarly, in this case if I observe an object from a frame which is moving say towards the right with acceleration a all the parts of this body are accelerating backwards with the same acceleration a. So, it is as if the body is an effective gravitational field with gravitational acceleration minus a. Just like the force out here the net force in this case acts on the center of gravity which we call the net force is m g and it is at acts at the center of gravity in exactly the same manner out here also since the force is uniform acceleration for each particle it will also be acting on the center of gravity towards minus a direction and the total force would be m a minus m a, but it will work at the center of gravity. So, that is a sort of similarity between uh, the, the pseudo force observed in a uniformly accelerating frame and a gravitational force. The way we can use this fact that things in an accelerating frame appear to be being pulled by a gravitational kind of force, we can use them to solve problems in much, much, much easier way in certain situations and this I will best illustrate through examples. Let us take the first example where whether I solve in an inertial frame or non inertial frame it does not matter. If I take a car and I have a pendulum in it and the car is accelerating to this side with an acceleration a. Let me use small a now. What would be the position of the pendulum in this car? You can al almost feel that the pendulum is going to be like this if the car is accelerating, but why should it be with this angle here theta. We will solve this problem both in the non inertial and the inertial frame. In the inertial frame that is frame from outside the free body diagram of the pendulum in this position is that on the bob there is a tension T force m g pulling it down and as a result of these two forces the bob is accelerating to the right with an acceleration a because the car is accelerating and the bob is stationary in the car. If this angle is theta then you can see that T cosine of theta is equal to m g because the ball is not moving up and down and T sine of theta is equal to m a because the bob is accelerating towards the right with an acceleration a and that gives you tangent of theta equals a over g. What if I look at the same problem in a non inertial frame? And what frame do I choose? I choose the frame which is attached with the car and moving to the right with it. In this frame, you see the bob in equilibrium under the force mg, tension T, and a fictitious force ma to the left. Notice that when I am sitting in the car, the bob or the pendulum is in equilibrium position because with respect to the car frame it is not moving at all. The three forces are to be balanced for equilibrium and that gives you T cosine of theta equals m g and T sine of theta equals m a. Notice the difference 
in the inertial frame T sin theta gives you an acceleration towards the right. In the non inertial frame T sin theta balances the fictitious force with the final result of course, being the same that tangent theta is A over G. So, you see two way of looking at the same problem and of course, I should get the same final answer same effect. As I commented earlier that I can think of this uh, ex, uh, the, the, the force fictitious force in a uniformly accelerating frame as a gravitational force is illustrated beautifully by this example, because now the pendulum is at an angle theta from the vertical and that tangent theta is given by A by G. If I look at it from the gravitational field point of view, the pendulum is actually in a gravitational field, which is the sum of these two gravitational fields, acceleration G this way and acceleration A this way. So, not the net gravitational field is the sum of these two and that is in this direction, which is shown here by the big arrow. And this is at an angle theta with tangent theta equals A over G. Any pendulum in its equilibrium aligns with the gravitational field. So, no wonder that the pendulum is aligned with this in its equilibrium position. And that is the explanation for this. So, you can see that thinking of this field in a, uh, the, the pseudo force or pseudo field in a non inertial frame is like a gravitational field is meaningful and gives you the right answer. Using this, now we will solve a slightly more complicated problem, which will show you that actually going to non inertial frame sometimes makes life very, very easy. The problem that we solve now is, suppose there is a pendulum. and its support is suddenly accelerated to the right with an acceleration A. Which way would the pendulum move and by how much angle? That is the question that we want to answer. First, let us solve this problem in the inertial frame attached to the ground. I am solving it for two reasons. One, you will see how to solve a difficult problem and two, when you compare the solution in an inertial frame compared to the solution in a non inertial frame, you will see the effectiveness of solving problems in a non inertial frame sometimes. So, in this case, when this accelerates to the right, let us assume that the pendulum also swings to the right with this angle being theta. I am choosing it to swing to the right, so that this way is theta positive and theta dot will be greater than 0 for pendulum to the swinging to the right. This I do, because now I am going to fix my frame like this x and y and initially let the pendulum I will plotted with blue be here with the bob at the origin. And as the pendulum is its base is its, its pivot point is accelerated to the right with A, we are assuming that after some time T the pendulum would look like this with it having rotated by an angle theta to the right with respect to vertical. As I commented earlier, I choose this direction as theta positive, because then theta dot and x dot have the same positive direction and that is important. Otherwise, I may have to I may have to change sign along the way. Let me write for the bob position its coordinate as x b and y b, and for the support, let me write x and y. So 
So, let me make this picture once more. What we have is this frame at t equal to 0, this is the way the pendulum is and after time t, the base has moved here, the pendulum has moved this way by an angle theta. This distance is one half a t square because the base or the, 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 the support of the pendulum is moving with an acceleration a. This is x b y b and y of the support does not change. Let the tension in the string be t. Let us write the equations of motion for the ball. I am going to have x b double dot is equal to minus t sin theta divided by m that is my equation 1. I am going to have y b double dot is equal to t cosine of theta over m minus g that is my equation 2 because in the bob in the vertical direction there is t, t cosine theta component and a g component. How many unknowns do I have? I have unknown x b, I have unknown y b, I have unknown theta and I have tension t four unknowns. So, I need two more equations. Those equations are provided by the relationship between x b, y b and the coordinate of the support. The support has moved by a distance one half a t square and that is equal to x b minus if the length of the pendulum is l it is going to be minus l sin of theta. Similarly, I am going to have y of the support equal to y b this is y b plus l cosine of theta this is my equation 3 and equation 4. I have gotten 4 equations, 4 unknowns and I can solve for them. So, let us do that. Let me rewrite the equations once more and then we will solve for the problem. So, I have x b double dot equals minus t sin theta divided by m. I have y b double dot equals t cosine theta divided by m minus g. I have one half a t square equals x b minus l sin of theta. If I differentiate this once, it gives me a t equals x b dot minus l cosine of theta theta dot. If I differentiate it once more, it gives me a equals x b double dot minus 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 plus l sin theta theta dot square minus l cosine of theta theta double dot and let me call this equation number 3. Similarly, y equals y b plus l cosine of theta gives me y dot is 0, 0 equals y b dot minus l sin theta theta dot differentiating it once more I get 0 equals y b double dot minus l sin theta or minus l cosine theta theta dot square minus l sin theta theta double dot. Let me call this equation number 4. So, I have equation number 1 here. We box them. This is equation number 1 equation number 2, equation number 3 and equation number 4. Let me substitute for x b double dot in terms of t and y b double dot in terms of t in equation number 3 and 4. And what do I get? I am going to get x b double dot which is minus minus t 
sin theta over m plus l sin theta theta dot square let me confirm that plus l sin theta theta dot square minus l cosine of theta theta double dot is equal to a and for the y equation I get let me again see this y b double dot minus cosine theta theta dot square minus l sin theta. So, I am going to get y b double dot which is t cosine theta over m minus g minus l cosine of theta theta dot square minus l sin of theta theta double dot is equal to 0. Let me call this equation number 5 and equation number 6. Multiply equation number 5 by cosine of theta and multiply equation number 6 by sin of theta and add. If I add, if I do that, I get the first term t minus t sin theta cosine theta plus t cosine theta sin theta that cancels. Second term L sin theta theta dot square cosine theta minus L cosine theta sin theta theta dot square that cancels. So, I get minus g sin of theta these two terms these two terms give me minus l cosine square theta plus sin square theta that is 1 theta double dot is equal to a cosine of theta. In other words l theta double dot is equal to minus a cosine of theta minus g sin of theta that is my equation for theta. I have done my job I solve this equation and I can get all the answers let us do that. So, the equation that we have gotten is l theta double dot is equal to minus a cosine of theta minus g sin of theta let us put theta double dot equals one half d by d theta of theta dot square and integrate it to get l by 2 theta dot square is equal to minus a sin theta plus g cosine theta plus a constant c. However, at theta equal to 0 when it started theta dot is equal to 0 and that gives me c equals minus g and therefore, l by 2 theta dot square comes out to be minus a sin theta minus g 1 minus cosine of theta that is your solution for theta dot square. So, what we have got is when I have a pendulum at a support and suddenly the support moves with an acceleration a I am going to have the angle of this change by l theta dot square is going to be equal to minus a sin theta minus g 1 minus cosine of theta. Note 1 theta cannot be positive. If theta becomes positive the right hand side would be negative and that will give you theta dot square to be negative which cannot happen. Therefore, the pendulum has to swing in negative theta direction it has to swing back. So, after some time its position would be something like this it would have swung in theta negative direction and where does it stop? So, question we ask where is theta dot square 0? One answer of course, is theta equals 0 which we point we started with and the second point is going to be 0 equals minus a sin theta minus g 1 minus cosine theta which I can write as minus 2 a sin theta by 2 cosine theta by 2 minus 2 g 
sin square theta by 2 and that gives you ok let us see this sin theta by 2 one of them drops out this 2 drops out and that gives you tangent of theta by 2 equals minus a over g. So, theta dot square becomes 0 again when tangent of theta by 2 is minus a over g. So, here was a support which suddenly moved towards this with acceleration a and the final position is such that at a point such that this angle is alpha then tangent alpha by 2 is minus a upon g or alpha just in magnitude is equal to tan inverse a over g times 2. This has a beautiful interpretation. Remember earlier this was the angle which has tangent theta equals a over g that angle where the new equilibrium point of the pendulum was. So, in a way the pendulum has swung across the equilibrium point by as much angle as it was away from it on one side and this is a solution that we have gotten by solving in a, an inertial frame. Let us see now how would the solution look in a non inertial frame. Non inertial frame moving with the support. So, I look at this whole thing in a non inertial frame moving with the support. In that frame, this is the equilibrium position of the pendulum such that this angle is tan inverse a over g. So, in this non inertial frame this is the equilibrium position. So, I am looking at the pendulum as if it is moved to one side from the equilibrium position by an angle tan inverse a over g. Recall what happens if I have a pendulum from the equilibrium position if it is left by if it is raised by an angle theta to one side, what happens when it swings back? It swings exactly by the same angle to the other side. So, in this move, in this frame, accelerating frame, the pendulum will swing across the equilibrium point exactly by the same angle as it was initially to the one side, and that is going to be tan inverse a over g. So, the total swing. of the pendulum from the vertical is equal to 2 tan inverse a over g. Now, I would like you to appreciate the power of having solved this problem in a non inertial frame. While solving in the inertial frame, I had to do work with many many equations 4 or 5 equations and had to manipulate manipulate a lot of them. On the other hand when I went to non inertial frame the problem could be solved in 3 or 4 lines and that is the power of using non inertial frames in certain problems. Having established that non inertial frames do provide particularly in this case uh, uniformly moving non inertial frames do provide a uh, method of solving problems in an easier way we will now solve a few examples. Most of them will be from the book of Kleppner. So, we will solve illustrative problems. Problem 1, this is taken from the book of Kleppner whose reference I have already given you. If I have a car, moving with acceleration a to the right and it has a rod on the pivot of length l and mass m. We want to find at what angle from the top of the car 
voted balance and what happens when it is moved from that balance point slightly. So, let us first calculate angle theta at which the bar is balanced. We have already established that going to a uniformly moving frame makes problems easy. So, we will be solving this problem in a uniformly moving frame which is attached to, to the car and therefore, accelerating to the right with acceleration A. When the rod is in equilibrium in this uniformly moving accelerating frame, it is under equilibrium, it is in equilibrium under the forces of m g and as I have already argued, I can think of the fictitious force m a like an effective gravitational force which is working in the direction opposite to the direction of acceleration of the frame and it also acts on the center of gravity. So, it is under the influence of m a to the left and there are normal reactions at the pivot let us call this n 1 to the right and n 2 vertically up. So, this rod is under equilibrium in equilibrium under these forces minus m a n 1 n 2 and m g. Let us go to the next page and show this free body diagram of the rod again. It has a force m g acting downwards a force m a working to the left normal reaction n 1 working to the right normal reaction n 2 working to the vertically up and summation f x equals to 0 gives me n 1 equals m a summation f y equal to 0 gives me n 2 equals m g and summation torque about pivot gives me if this angle is theta and the length of the rod is L, it gives me L over 2 sin theta times m a minus m g times L over 2 cosine of theta equal to 0. m drops out L by 2 drops out and that gives me tangent of theta equals g over a. So, the rod is at an angle theta such that tangent theta equals g over a from the horizontal. What direction is this? Recall earlier I had told you if there is an acceleration and there is g, then the effective gravitational field is this one. The sum total of the two at this angle which is tangent theta equals g over 2. So, it is not surprising that the rod is in equilibrium precisely aligned up with the direction of the effective gravitational field. It is like an inverted pendulum. Right? It is like a pendulum you can sort of put pointing up and that will also be in equilibrium. However, inverted pendulum is in unstable equilibrium. If you just disturb it slightly from the equilibrium point, it takes off. So, this rod should also be in an unstable equilibrium. Let us see that in the next part of the problem. So, in part b, we see what happens to the rod when it is disturbed from its equilibrium. position. 
the rod is at an angle theta from the horizontal or from the top of the car and what we do now is disturb it slightly by an angle phi. What happens then? Naturally, there is a force M A working to the left M G pulling it down and if I write the equation for theta plus phi ab about the pivot point here, let us see what that equation looks like. So, that equation is going to look like I where I is the moment of inertia of the rod about the pivot point theta plus phi double dot which is nothing but I phi double dot theta is a given fixed angle is equal to phi is going this way positive. So, it is going to be equal to m a l by 2 sin of theta plus phi minus m g l by 2 cosine of theta plus phi. Let us expand this. When we expand this, we are going to get m l by 2 can be taken out a sin theta cosine phi plus a cosine theta sin phi minus g cosine theta cosine phi plus g sin theta sin phi. Let us take phi to be very small, so that sin phi is almost phi and cosine phi is 1 and therefore, I get i phi double dot is equal to ok. Let us let us look here a sin theta m l by 2 a sin theta plus a cosine theta times phi minus g cosine theta minus g cosine theta plus g sin theta times phi. Recall tangent theta is g over a and therefore, cosine theta is equal to a over a square root of g square plus a square and sin theta is g over sorry cos cosine theta is a over g over square root of g square plus a square. Let us substitute that and then we get i phi double dot is equal to m l over 2 a sin theta is g over a square root of g square plus a square plus a cosine theta is a over square root of g square plus a square phi minus g cosine theta is a over a square root of a squ g square plus a square plus g sin theta is g over a square root of g square plus a square phi. This term cancels and you get this is equal to m l over 2 square root of g square plus a square times phi. And therefore, the equation when the rod is disturbed from its equilibrium position is i phi double dot is equal to m l by 2 square root of g square plus a square phi or i phi double dot minus m l over 2 i square root of g square plus a square phi equal to 0. And the solution of this we have already seen in many many examples is of the form phi equals a e raise to lambda t plus b e raise to minus lambda t where lambda is lambda square is 
m l over 2 i the square root of g square plus a square. So, you can see with time the solution is going to grow, phi is going to grow and therefore, the equilibrium is unstable. Problem number 2, we do suppose I have a car whose door is open at the right angle to the car and suddenly the car accelerates to the right with an acceleration a. I want to find as the door swings back when it has swung by an angle theta what is its angular speed. As I said earlier it is best to go to an accelerating frame in this case and you will see that the door hinged here is sort of moving in a gravitational field with a force m a being applied at its center of gravity at an angle theta the force acts as a center of gravity on this side m a. If the width of the door is w then the distance from the hinge to the force if it has moved by an angle theta here is w by 2 sin of theta. Oh, sorry, it is w by 2 cosine of theta and therefore, the equation of motion of the door in the accelerating frame is going to be i where i is the moment of inertia of the door theta double dot is equal to m a w over 2 cosine of theta. Again writing theta double dot as 1 half d over d theta theta dot square we get i theta dot square divided by 2 as equal to m a w over 2 sin theta plus a constant, but theta dot square is equal to 0 for theta equal to 0 and therefore, i theta dot square over 2 is equal to m a w over 2 sin of theta and that gives you the angular velocity of the door at an angle theta when the car starts accelerating towards the right. There is a nice interpretation of this and you will see that really the interpreting of this force fictitious force m a like a gravitational field makes sense. When this is moving towards the right with acceleration a we can consider this door to be in a gravitational field with the gravitational acceleration a. By the time the door has swung by an angle theta a center of mass has come down by this much distance here and that distance that it has traveled along the direction of minus a is nothing but w over 2 sin of theta and therefore, change in its potential energy is equal to m a which is the force times w over 2 sin of theta it is by that much that its potential energy has decreased and therefore, the increase in the kinetic energy should be precisely that m a w over 2 sin of theta and that is your answer. By the time door shuts that is it comes all the way back then theta equals pi by 2 for door to shut. So, it shuts at an speed theta dot square which is equal to 2 m a w over 2 i 2 cancels equals m a w over i. That gives you the angular speed with which the door shuts. That is another example of solving the problem using accelerating frames. As a, as a third problem, I take a problem that you must have seen sometime. Sometimes you must have seen that if you have a motorcycle and the rider accelerates it suddenly at a very high acceleration. Then you see it tends to topple the upper the, the front wheel sort of lifts off the ground and we want to calculate as to at what acceleration does it start lifting off the ground. I am again going to look at this problem from a frame 
which is accelerating with the motorcycle towards the right with A. If it does that, then the motorcycle is in equilibrium, it is not moving in that, that frame and if I look at the motorcycle, it is in equilibrium under the following forces. There is a force N2 on the back wheel, normal reaction N1 on the front wheel, there is a frictional force F1 on the front wheel, there is a frictional force F2 on the back wheel, there is a fictitious force working on the center of gravity towards the left M A and at the center of gravity there is a force, gravitational force M G. Let us take the height of the center of gravity from the ground to be H and let us take the distance between the two wheels to be B. We wish to calculate as to at what acceleration does the front wheel start getting off the ground. So, in this accelerating frame, the motorcycle is in equilibrium under these forces. Let us write the equilibrium conditions. You get summation F x is equal to 0, which gives me F 1 plus F 2 equals M A. Summation F y equals 0 gives me N 1 plus N 2 equals M G. and the torque about any point should be 0. Let us take for convenience the torque about the center of gravity. Let me make the picture again for you in the next page. Here is the motorcycle with distance B here, center of gravity being at height H from the ground. There is normal reaction N 2 n 1, there is friction f 2, f 1 and there is this force at the center of gravity m a and m g and we have already found that f 1 plus f 2 equals m a and n 1 plus n 2 equals m g and balancing the torque about C g equal to 0 gives me F 1 plus F 2 which is a counterclockwise torque times H equals N 2 which gives you a clockwise torque minus N 1 minus because N 1 gives you a counterclockwise torque times B by 2. If I assume that the center of gravity lies right in the middle of the two wheels and therefore, substituting F 1 plus F 2 equals M A, M A H equals N 2 minus N 1 B by 2 or N 2 minus N 1 equals M A H times 2 divided by B and I already know that N 2 plus N 1 equals M G. I have got these two equations to solve for N 2 and N 1. So, let me show again there is a by motorcycle, here is the center of gravity, here is reaction N 1, here is reaction N 2 and we have found that N 2 minus N 1 is equal to 2 M A H over B and N 2 plus N 1 is equal to M G and that gives you N 2 equals M G over 2 plus M A H divided by B and N 1 equals m g over 2 minus m a h divided by b. When the front wheel lifts off the ground n 1 equals 0 and that gives you m g over 2 minus m a h over b equals 0 m drops out and therefore, a equals we go to the next page you have m g over 2 minus m a h over b equal to 0 m has dropped out. So, a equals 
g b over 2 h. If the acceleration is g b over 2 h, the front wheel would start lifting off the ground. So, if you keep acceleration below this, the front wheel does not go up. Similarly, if you decelerate exactly opposite would happen, the rear wheel would start coming off the ground that I leave for you as a problem. To conclude this lecture, what we have done today is looked at solving the problem in a uniformly accelerating frame. In the coming lectures, we will go to an another kind of rotating, uh, another kind of non inertial frame which is a rotating frame. Our earth is one example of that and see the consequences of that.